All right, with that, running a little early, but uh, Chris Cochran is here, it looks like. Would you like to <laughs> yeah, join us? Start. Um, Jacob's going to be here, but um, I can sort of get going, keep you on schedule. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me back. Um, Chris Cochran from the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. I'm the Director of Community Planning and Revitalization, and I, within the agency, I work for the Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, <clears throat> I have, I guess last time I was here, I ran out of time. I don't have a, a whole bunch of slides, um, but what I was gonna do is just kind of reset everybody on kind of where we are on this bill, talk through a few points and then go to the slides. And then um, I think, you know, from the testimony of watch, there's some, a couple of questions. Um, and if, if that works, if you have time, you know, I think we can probably dial into some of those questions. Um, Jacob, hopefully will be here. He's kind of the detail guy. So um, if we could hold off on those to the end, that'd be great. Um, so updating everybody on where things are, um, last Thursday, the Senate unanimously passed S226. Um, the bill um, came over Friday and it was referred to House General. Um, I understand, you know, they're already taking testimony on it now. Um, and I understand you guys are looking at this stuff in Title 10 and Title 24, and that I presume Ways and Means is looking at the tax credits in Title 32. Um, just as a reminder, kind of how we got here, Bill stems from a, a memo that a bunch of local planners wrote um, and sent, shared with legislators and, and with us, um, recommending state level changes to remove barriers to housing in our compact centers. Um, I think Representative Bongart's got a copy of this bill, and I think, or the bill of the memo rather, and that was our starting out place for H511. Um, we had a stakeholder group. We worked on this. A, long time, many, many meetings, um, and included DNRC, the Regional Planning Commissions, the Vermont Planners Association, um, to, re to really refine and, and review, um, re refine and kind of dial in um, the, the language then the bill that ultimately became H511. Um, it was a really good process. Um, I think everybody involved, I think you heard testimony last week, said it was a good process. Everybody was listening to it. We kind of found common ground. That's not always easy, um, but it was a really good group, and I was really pleased that we landed where we did. Um, last week, um, the Agency of Natural Resources, VNRC, the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, VHFA, and VLC all testified in support of that, of, of the bill. That doesn't always happen. So I think um, hats off to you, Representative Bongars, for you know doing a great job on getting everybody on board. Um, Senate Natural Resources and Energy also reviewed the sections in 511, and they were also supportive. So we've got a whole lot of people lined up around like these are good changes that will support housing in our compact centers. Um, really, the only voice of opposition I've heard was you know from Thomas Weiss, uh, Weiss the engineer, um, and I, I I was sick. I didn't get a chance to hear his testimony, but I know A and R had some concerns about some of the statements made, and I hope they're gonna I think they're gonna come in tomorrow and hopefully correct some of the record there. So that's background update you kind of where we are for my understanding of where things are. Um, you know, why are we here? You know, we have a housing crisis. Um, we're all trying to work together to solve our housing problem. Um, it's a top priority of the speaker and the pro tem. You know, Vermonters really need your help. I need your help. I've got two vacant positions and I can't fill them because all I what's happening in state agencies we're stealing employees from each other because they're living here and they already have homes. If you recruit somebody from out of state, they accept the position contingent on finding housing and they can't. And it's really, you know, that's, this is state government. It's happening all across, you know, in the businesses, you know, it's really hurting. We do need to really find a solution. And S226 um, and for that matter, S234, I think provide meaningful changes that can help us move the needle to kind of create more housing options in our centers. Um, 226, you know, aligns state level policy, Act 250, local bylaws <clears throat> with new funding to create housing out and create more homes in our walkable centers. Um, we've been talking at length with the media. Seven Days is working on a big story. I expect it to come out tomorrow about the housing crisis, some of the challenges, some of the barriers that I think if unintentionally been created at the state and local level to housing and centers, and they're going to relate it to this bill and how this bill is going to um, um, hopefully solve some of these problems. Um, I know this committee is, you know, prone to 
at weakening the housing bill to take off the 511 pieces to support the Act 250 bill. And I would, I hope you don't do that. Housing is a real challenge. And I would like to see um, request, you know, obviously it's your choice, but keeping the housing bill together intact, I think is really important given the severity of the crisis. Um, so with that, I'm gonna pause. And then I'm, I have, like I said, I've got a, a couple slides more left in my presentation. Um, and then from what I saw from testimony, there were some questions around like kind of how tax credits work. I'm happy to ask, answer those. I think you had some questions around the safe infill provisions within centers, um, questions around the infrastructure requirements for neighborhood development areas. Were there other items off the top of your head that, okay. All right, so with that, I'm gonna- Representative McCullough. Yes, thank you for asking that question. Were there other issues? And, and you sort of touched on it, but uh -huh. um, as, as you recall, uh, this committee pulled out the wastewater and water connections part of uh, as what is it 101 last year, and they've been uh, put back in here. And I, for one, have an uh, inability to understand how the trade-off. Um, it's going to create lots more housing. The trade off being um, agency oversight. How does the lack of agency oversight create lots more housing, which we all understand we need? Um, what, 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 I don't get the nexus there. I think I, I think I have a good answer to your question. Um, could I hold them all to the end? I wanted to get through my last oh, I, slide. I, I beg your pardon. I yeah. thought you asked for. Oh no, I just wanted to know like what are the list of things that you guys wanted to talk about? Oh well, that would be one of them. So I got that one on the list. Yeah, that's yes. fine. Sure, sure. Um, and Lizzie, I think we queued up those slides. Are they? Okay, great. Um, thank you. I'm going to sit to the side so I can actually see what I'm talking about here. Um, if you recall, you know, Jacob and I just kind of gave you a high level of you kind of the why in the bill. Um, saying this is where I ran out of time or the committee ran out of time. Um, so the, really the focus of this bill is to create the, an easier path for communities to achieve neighborhood area designation. Um, right now, these are the, the communities that have the neighborhood designation. If you look, there's a decided trend. What county are they from primarily? Chittenden County. Well, they're from Chittenden County because um, that is where the housing development is. Um, it tends to help right now the benefits that we have for neighborhood development areas, growing communities. There's really no meaningful benefit for smaller communities, and that's what we're hoping to change in this bill. Some of the next next slide, please. Are those, are those towns in a particular order? No, they're just, yeah, they may be alphabetical. I think they might be in the order that they were created, according. I don't know. I think I just, I made the list. Um, like the last... Sure. Yeah, I think they are in a relative order of like when they're, yeah, because I think I just had a running list and I was just adding them as they were. Yes. Well, thank you for making that point because yeah. that was my question. Yeah. What's in it for smaller communities? Yeah. So I appreciate that. Not a whole lot, but I'll tell you more about that. So thank you for asking. Um, one of the major barriers, you know, obviously, an Act 250 benefit is not a, a great benefit for a smaller town um, because there's not a lot of developers working outside of Chittenden County. So generally, Chittenden and Franklin County see the most of the development. Um, but really the bigger barrier to a smaller community achieving the neighborhood area designation was they we have to update their bylaws. They have to support compact development within their centers. And the state is chronically underfunded planning historically since forever, I think um, maybe for the last 20 years. So communities really didn't have the resources to make this change. Um, the good thing is, and thanks to the, with the help and support of this committee, we did you know, launch those bylaw modernization grants we now have 41 communities who are actively working to modernize their bylaws. The requirements of the bylaw modernization grants, no coincidence, line up very well with the requirements of the neighborhood area designation. So getting the bylaws up to speed, I think we're working on that. So we should achieve, you know, within the next year or so, a lot of communities will um, qualify for the neighborhood area designation that they otherwise wouldn't have without this investment. So thank you for your support on that. Next slide, please. Um, again, the major benefit right now for the neighborhood area designation is the Act 250 benefit for priority housing projects. You've heard a lot about this. 
Um, you know, the 10 acres, 10 units, it's a blunt instrument to gauge developmental impacts, um, but it's what we have. It's the rule, it's the law, um, but it becomes really, really challenging in centers. Um, it's, it's one thing, you know, because you have a lot of neighbors, you have a lot of people concerned about any change in their community. So it creates a very appeal rich environment for people to raise concerns about any project. So the solution, um, this was several years ago, and it's gone through iterations over the time was a jurisdictional change for, to support affordable housing in our centers. We know we need affordable housing, affordable housing in centers um, is naturally affordable housing because you don't necessarily have to have two cars to, to work or to get to school. Um, um, <clears throat> they are compact centers, so you can get a lot of the services that you need right there. Um, so it's been enormously effective. I think the NRB ran some data recently, and there's been over 200, uh, 200, oh, 2,500 priority housing project units approved in the last five years. If you look at the data, they're mostly in Chittenden County because that's where the growth area is, and that's where the neighborhood area designations are occurring. Um, but we need a solution for the entire state um, and obviously creating more compact development within these centers you know, meets our environmental goals um, and our climate emission goals too. So I, I wanted, we want, this bill aims to make smaller towns um, like level the playing field for them so they can create more housing options within their centers. Um, next slide. Thanks. That said, smaller towns, you know, I think I mentioned before that, um, you know, Chittenden County, Franklin County, you know, some areas around White River Drunk, the White River um, Junction, um, they have developers who, who do projects. Um, there's, you know, they know the rules of the road there. That's where they build. That's where they're comfortable building. Um, so the Act 50 exemption that comes with the neighborhood development area destination is not the most attractive benefit for a smaller town. Um, so that's, you know, what would a small town need? Um, small towns, my town, my village where I live, there's two abandoned homes. It's, it's been that way for 20 years. People are not improving these buildings because the economics don't make sense. It costs too much to fix them up. Um, but those buildings are an eyesore. They're a drag in the community. I would love to see them fixed up. I would love to see two new families in our communities. Lord knows our schools need more children in them um, to remain sustainable. Um, so that's what we're hoping is, you know, the expansion of the downtown and village center tax credits. It's been enormously effective in revitalizing our downtowns and village centers, expanding them to focus on neighborhoods um, and improving housing in and around the designated center. That we believe is a tool that smaller towns will respond to because that's what their need is. Um, and there's a couple, we all drive around, I guess you go home to your districts. You see these homes all the time. You know, I know you're worried about second homes in the state, but I'm, you know, my background is historic preservation. I worry about all the abandoned homes that are just composting. And when we, these are, these are buildings already in the ground. They're easier to permit. Let's fix them up um, and create new housing options um, located in and around our centers. Chris, though, brings up a point around um, private property and the <laughs> the cost of land, which got some press this morning in public radio, but um, these are private properties, right. um, and they all probably have a different story yep. uh, or reason that they are not being used. And I guess I'm not sure a tax credit is what's going to reach into the. Well, we have the same. I mean, stepping back twenty years, we had the same problem in our downtowns. <laughs> all private property owners, nobody was investing in their buildings. How do you get somebody to do that? Um, and we created this tax incentive that somebody took a chance on. We had empty upper floors, just ground floors of buildings. So they were completely underutilized. They weren't doing anything productive to the community. They weren't creating any vitality in the community. And the same question I'm sure was asked them, well, how are you going to make a property owner do something that they don't want to do? We found the tax incentive caught people's attention. Several, you know, there's a reluctance, I think, at times to take advantage of some state programs and benefits. Um, but once a couple people did, um, it was you know, a snowball effect. You know, our downtowns, you know, I think if you recall my slides from a couple from last week, you know, Bristol 25 years ago versus Bristol today, it's remarkable what that change has seen. It does have an effect on the neighborhoods, but there are many communities, especially in our rural areas, there's just nobody going to invest in it. It's don't work. But if you create an incentive there, I think people will start thinking outside the box about how can they make 
the numbers work on something like this. And if it is a family that's disagreeing over, you know, who's going to fix up the old family home or whatever the circumstances are, oftentimes putting an incentive out there and a, and a buyer willing to take on that building is what can change things up. So I agree with you. There are all different circumstances for why buildings are abandoned, why they're underutilized. We found from the downtown tax credits that it is an incentive that does get people to think differently. And would the proposal in the bill address rural, rural develop, uh, housing? Like these look better. Well, and in a very limited area, you know, because really, you know, if you recall, um, you know, we're focused on centers only. Um, so downtowns and villages and, you know, the neighborhood area that is designated out of them, um, around them. So we're not talking all across the landscape. We're just talking about those close in homes and built up areas. That's where the benefit would be targeted. It'd be great if we could do more. But I think given the amount of resources we're looking at, the Senate supporting a $2 million increase, the downtown and village center tax credits to support neighborhood development areas, to get more communities achieving this designation, um, um, that's probably all we can do to see a meaningful effect. If it was an everywhere benefit, I, it would be very expensive and um, Chair Ansel would not be very supportive. <laughs> I guess I'm headed towards like, it'd be good if we could have specific examples um, as we explore the bill further, and these all look very rural and not necessarily yeah, in designated are, areas. I, I will be candid. These are these are you know clip art of abandoned old buildings. I can show you two buildings in my community that I've lived there for twenty years. Um, oh, yeah, no, I'm familiar with them, and we've all seen them. Um, they my village just got village center designation, and I know everybody in the neighborhood would be very excited to see these buildings improved. And can you remind us what your town had to do to get a village center designation? I had to fill out the application. <laughs> yeah, and so uh, the process is fairly simple. Um, village center is kind of our uh, low barrier designation. Um, you know, you have to have a village that meets the definition. So there has to be some there there. So it has to be some kind of commercial use. Um, there has to be some kind of mix, mix of services. It can't just be a residential area. Um, so there has to be like, you know, a municipal building or some kind of community gathering space or a store or something like that out there. Um, but very small, my village is very small. Um, we were designated um, Janet Ansel's village of Maple Corner. You know, it's a village store and a few other buildings around it that are a community center. It was designated. Um, but they're very tight geographies, again. Um, um, you fill out the application, the RPC Regional Planning Commissions work with you to go through, you know, you delineate a boundary um, and then you go to the downtown board. So this is you know, our designated village center. We'd like to designate it. And the primary benefit that comes with it right now is the tax credits to improve existing buildings, only commercial buildings. And this bill would extend that to village centers, the housing? Well, um, right now they, downtowns and villages are eligible for the tax credits. What this bill would do is extend that area to villages who achieve the neighborhood development area designation. So it would create a larger benefit area and it would allow investments in housing. And to be, you know, sorry, getting into the details, it is only for commercial houses and rental properties. It is not going to improve single family homes. But if you want to do an accessory dwelling unit or anything like that, so long as it's kind of quote unquote income producing, it would qualify. But to add an NDA, I just want to make sure we're clear on what's happening in the bill. So I'm sort of asking, but so the, the neighborhood development area in a, a village center would be able to have a neighborhood development area if it did what? Oh, they'd have to meet all the neighborhood development area requirements. So they'd have to, you know, Jacob walked you through all those different requirements. Um, they have to have bylaws updated, kind of checking that box, priming the pump there so more communities can qualify. Um, um, Jacob, I don't know if you can off the top of your head, go yes, to it. Well, sure, yeah. for the record, I'm, I'm Jake Cameron, planning policy manager at the Department of Housing Community Development and program manager for the Neighborhood Development Area designation. Yeah, well, sure. um, so to become a designated Neighborhood Development Area, the municipality has had a, a regional planning commission approved planning process. Um, they have to have a pre-application meeting with the Department of Housing and Community Development we're worth looking at what's uh, uh, looking at the area that the municipality is interested in designating. Uh, when we are doing that, we're evaluating if the location uh, is within the planning area radius, which is a half mile around downtowns, and a quarter mile around town centers or uh, village centers. Uh, and so that's kind of the starting point, although there is a little bit of given that boundary where the downtown board can 
uh, push it out or bring it in from that radius um, based on certain criteria. Um, and for instance, like if there's a lot of constraints, conserved land within the within the planning area, or uh, or if there are uh, considerable steep slopes or areas that are not served by uh, municipal water and sewer under the current current guiding statute. Uh, we also look at the natural resources that are within the area, including um, anything that's defined under uh, Title 24 as an important natural resource. So that's uh, wetlands, ag soils, um, steep slopes, those types of things. We, we evaluate if they have complete streets, what's served by sidewalks, what's planned for um, sidewalk or pedestrian connections. Uh, we're looking at historic resources within the neighborhood development area. And then we're really digging into the bylaws, what densities are allowed, and it needs to match. The bylaws need to allow at least the existing average density of the, of the area or be at least four dwelling units per acre. Um, and then we go into uh, a variety of checklists of complete streets and building lot and development patterns. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty thorough um, process. And it's, I think it's part of the reason why there are 10 designations, current designated neighborhood development areas currently. It, that it's a big lift for the benefits that are assigned to that designation right now. However, the addition of additional, if, if tax credits were extended uh, to support income producing properties, the renovation of income producing properties within neighborhood development areas, we think that that might be an added incentive um, to uh, for communities to pursue the designation and to update their bylaws um, to welcome uh, housing and neighborhoods uh, connected to their core civic and commercial area. And can you remind us who the downtown board is? Um, it's a, it's a, I want to say like 13 member panel. Um, I can get you the exact titles of everybody. Um, a lot of it is um, state agency heads. So the head of, or their designee of, of the trans ANR, the natural resources board. Um, but there's also, you know, my agency, the H or ACCD has a rep, um, but there's also representatives from local government. So VLCT has a rep, um, the preservation trust and BNRC a rep. Um, I can get you the complete list, but it's a, it's a board com comprised of kind of folks, agency folks and folks um, who are interested in supporting um, municipalities. Um, from our Planners Association has a member. Uh, let me just get you the final name. Or I'll get you the list. That'd be great. Um, and they meet, you know, I would say semi-monthly, just based on what application needs are in demand are. Um, the biggest thing that we're looking at right now for our next board meeting is um, there's a big increase in the downtown transportation fund. Um, that provides kind of sidewalks and street improvements that make our downtowns more walkable. Um, we got a $5 million one-time increase and we allowed, expanded the eligibility to include, I'm gonna go into the weeds, but you know about this program, Better Places. Um, so looking at alternative modes um, of um, you know, trails, bikes, um, sidewalks, you know, how do we make our communities more walkable, inviting to um, people and not just cars? Um, so we have, I think, nearly $2 million in requests, and we're very excited about uh, support that investment. Um, and then the other big thing we do is award tax credits, and that's a very busy and intense time. Um, but. Hmm. Can I ask a question? <clears throat> um, my first comment is um, I appreciate that integration because sometimes transportation projects such as a sidewalk may take 10 years of design time and public engagement to actually get it in the ground. And, and sometimes those designs are already set. <laughs> so yeah. to be able to, to integrate better the planning objectives is. Yeah, we do a great job, I think, in the state planning. What we do, where we fall down is implementation, design and implementation. So this is hoping, we're hoping to fill that gap. And that's what something we focused on. Thank you. And, and then my question is in regards to removing the municipal sewer infrastructure mm -hmm. and water. Was that simply because not to make that a barrier Absolutely. to, obviously they still need, if they're going to have compact development, um, they still need to make sure they provide for water and wastewater, but not to have it a barrier for the designation. Yeah, is that, is I mean, that, was exactly. That so in a case study that, for an example, um, Westford, 
don't know if you heard about their perils, you know, but you know, they wanted to create more housing options in the village center. They needed a wastewater system. Um, there is a process where you can kind of design a system, get it pre-approved by NR, and kind of proceed with the destination, but it was cumbersome. And you know, they had to make it real. So they had to go out to a bond boat. They had to do all these things. And you know, they just wanted to be able to support compact housing within their centers. That infrastructure requirement is a prerequisite was a huge stumbling block for them. It took them many years to get this. What this change does, obviously they still have to get a permit from ANR to do in-ground disposal. There's a lot of advanced technology that weren't available many years ago. Um, and you know, this, this effectively transfers the burden of finding, getting the permitting from the municipality that can struggle with these projects, the infrastructure in a town for many years to the developer who often can find solutions more quickly. Um, and because if the community can get the NDA designation, they are potentially eligible for the priority housing project if they create affordable housing in the community. Um, and there's examples all over the state. I think, you know, when you're just Irisburg, you know, they did disposal in the green. Uh, I think there's examples in Shoreham. You know, they happen all the time, but we just didn't want to have that like, no, you don't have this, you can't qualify. We want to be more inclusive and more welcoming to villages working to create vital, dense downtowns. Since we're on that topic, can you speak to what Thomas Weiss brought up in terms of the yeah. setback requirements on the um, shield areas around wells with septic? It's not my area of expertise, and I missed his testimony. I was sick that day, but I didn't know Jake. Yeah, I didn't. Know. Yeah, I can't. I can't speak directly to his concern, other than that these projects would still have to get a state yeah. water wastewater permit, and that they look at those separation distances and the shield areas. Um, and so, as far as I understand it, there would be you know lo no loss of protection. Would still have to be. A, they would still have to design a system that complies with the ANR's um, permitting standards for both water and wastewater systems. I guess the question is: Are you imagining that these are going to be more of a, um, a traditional village treatment, or are you thinking? more dispersed community. I mean, I'm, I'm sure it matters what kind of village we're talking about or area, but it does come up with on-site disposal. Yeah, and I think it could be in both cases where we could be, uh, where the downtown board could prospectively <laughs> designate an area that is currently on sewer and does not currently have plans for conceptually, a conceptual ANR design, um, but would allow a private developer um, or a community um, to say, we're getting our planning framework aligned uh, for compact housing development. And we don't know yet what the water wastewater service is going to be. We know we're going to have to permit it, whatever happens uh, with, the, with the agency of natural resources and Department, Department of Environmental Conservation. And so, um, so the planning framework enables compact development. The benefits of the neighborhood development, development area principally would be attractive to a developer doing compact development because the priority housing project exemption, this is getting a little wonky, I know. The priority housing project exemption is, uh, uh, is about affordability. And to get affordability, you by and large have to do density, right? One, um, yeah, but one of the kind of the co potential conflicts are that you need space to do an onsite yeah. and have room for wells to be yeah. protected. Many communities use, you know, a shared well, you know, from, from you know, further away um, so they can, you know, get the disposal ground closer. So there's, I mean, there's lots of different options and examples across the state where traditional, you know, systems can support the, the densities without having a big pipe system, which are very costly and very few communities until we were blessed with, you know, new federal funds or even considering, especially small towns, because they just won't bond for them. But in those instances, we have had to go back and put in a water system or correct the past conflicts. Um, I would hope the permitting process <laughs> catches that. Um, need to. Um, right. Yep. Okay. Keep going. Um, so I think we got, I'm sorry, just going to pick up where I left off. So the you know the tax credits to improve commercial build or the, the housing is really I think going to be a key incentive to get small towns engaged in thinking about how they can create a vital active neighborhood 
that supports the downtown or village center. Um, and Ways and Means has looked at this before um, and they were open to doing a pilot and the Senate bill essentially, it doesn't give, it's not exactly what Ways and Means approved of last year, um, but it's similar. It proposes a, you know, let's try this out and see if this works. Let's do it for five years and see what kind of outcomes we get. And then, so essentially it sunsets it where Ways and Means recommended a, just a five-year pilot. So I think they're very close. Um, I think it's going to be a great tool, um, one, to leverage the designations and two, help put underused buildings back into to service and get use for our communities. Um, so the next slide, the other thing that we're looking what at, quick question? I'm sorry. Question from Representative Morris. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, tax credits, I'm looking at the four buildings of yeah. the previous slide, four buildings. So you get a private developer or a private owner that's looking or not looking to necessarily develop that structure or to bring it back into housing. So we offer tax credits. What other incentives are there or how optimistic are we going to be that a, de a developer that doesn't have interest or an owner, yeah. a private, private owner doesn't have interest in developing that, that the tax credits will uh, be effective? Well, uh, optimism, pessimism. Well, it kind of this is similar. Other to enforcement question. action. Yeah, and this is similar to the question that the chair asked. You know, like, are you confident it's going to work? Well, it worked in our downtowns. It's the same tool. Um, it was very effective there. Um, so it, different circumstances. I don't know what, you know, how it's going to play out in your community or or in Manchester. Um, but I think the key thing to remember is the tax credits are only for an existing building. So if somebody wants to improve that building, they get the tax credits. If they tear that building down, they've lost the benefit. Um, they could tear the building down. And so long as the historic Division for Historic Preservation approves it, they could rebuild um, and use the Act 250 exemption to create a higher density housing option where a historic building was. I don't think I'm giving you the answer that you want, but uh, I'm struggling with the optimism that the that this is going to be effective. Um, you know, the ones that want to develop yeah. are willing to. All private owners that are willing to develop, right. it's a good program. The ones that don't, we we had people with their arms crossed in our downtown saying, "I'm not investing in any of these buildings." In the town you go to, you know, I don't care. Um, Montpelier, you know, nothing changed for a long, long time until we put these tax credits on the table. One person made the improvement. And they were getting higher rents than the other person was getting. So you, know, you can choose to let your property go down to nothing and not get a great return on it, or you can use a, a public benefit and make an investment and, and make some money. So these are all individual decisions. I don't know how it's going to play out, but I, I think from our experience in the downtowns, I think a similar effect. So again, these very tight geographies um, of housing in and around our centers, they're desirable places to live. They have usually stores, they have amenities. Um, why don't we put them into good use, you know? I, if in my community, if we pass this and my kind of village center designation and the NDA, well, we have the village and we got the NDA designation, I'd have to deal with some conflict issues, but I would go knock on that person's door and say, hey, you want me to sell me that house? Because I'm sick of looking at it. You know, there's other people who got care about where they live and they're going to improve the place where they live um, because that's, that's, where they live and they want to, they don't want to see an ice war in their community. And if they can use a public benefit to make the, the, the rehab pencil out, why would they not do it? I know you're skeptical. I'm not convincing you. I'm not skeptical. <laughs> uh, I'm from a community that uh, has done both. Yeah. We've developed our downtown, the vacant, dilapidated, unsafe, burned out structures. Yeah. And then we have others that have private owners yeah. that are not interested. Yeah. And, I, I hear what you're saying about the tax credits and the incentive for them to do that. I mean, our communities, some of them, you know, they didn't get run down overnight. This was like a hundred year slide. You know, you can't expect them to come back in 10 minutes. You know, so these tax credits are good for a hundred years. <laughs> well, they're, good, they're good until you until you use them. Um, no, as proposed, they're good for five years. So get them while you can. Um, but I think, you know, the confidence of community projects is in their building, you know, and what, you know, the picture of Bristol, you know, what, what place do you want to live in? Do you want one with buildings in good shape with, with active um, people walking around in the streets, or do you want one with a bunch of vacant buildings that are not being used? And I think you can't, that, that tipping point doesn't happen overnight, but it does happen. And we've seen, again, examples all over the state. So I do think it'll work. 
Um, we have five years if this bill passes to prove that it'll work. Um, if it doesn't, then it's sunsetted and that was a nice experiment. But we do get improved buildings that are on the grand list forever at an improved value. And we do have more people living in a community that otherwise wouldn't. So I, I think it's a, it's a low risk um, investment. All right, we're keeping going. So the other thing that in the tax credits is a proposal, and this is not a new proposal. You've seen this before. Um, as, as Representative Dolan knows well, everybody on this committee knows well, historically our, our downtowns and villages were located on water. Um, <clears throat> we've seen flooding. Um, these are historic buildings. They're part of our community character, brand, economy. You know, We need them. They're not going to be relocated, um, but we want people to look at opportunities to when they're making improvements to these buildings to get the utilities out of the basement um, to flood proof the building to the extent possible so when floods do occur um, the communities of people living in the building the businesses in the building can bounce back more quickly um, we do know climate change is coming um, you know it is inevitable um, but anything we can do to make an investment to help our communities become more proactive so our buildings are safe and our economy is not risk from these floods is a good investment. If you look at our coastal communities, they're doing this. Um, they're hardening their infrastructure. They're raising their buildings. Vermont is not doing this. Um, and I think it'd be a, a wise investment to encourage people to consider this while they're making improvements to their buildings. Right now, it's often not required because they're historic buildings, but with an incentive, I think we can get people to, to, to look at this option. Um, next slide. I think this is the last one. Um, again, coastal communities, you know, they're gonna experience the effects of climate change. They're already experiencing them in a, in a much, much higher degree than we are in Vermont. Um, you know, these people are gonna be reluctant to, to move. This is where they live. This is where their families are. This is where their jobs are. Um, but I think what we learned from the pandemic is everything has changed. Um, the state is making huge investments in broadband. We've all had to work from home for two years. We kind of figured it out. It seems to me like where one works is less relevant today. And I don't think we're ever going back. Um, we saw the relative safety of Vermont brought a lot of new people to the state because they felt like a safe place to live. We were out of the city. Bless their hearts, most of them didn't have broadband service. So they maybe regretted that decision. But we are enabling this backbone. We are a desirable place to live. If you look at the climate models for the future, Vermont is going to suffer from climate change, but not to the degree that the coastal areas are going to suffer. Um, I think you know we need to be thinking ahead proactively about what the state's going to look like 30 to 50 years from now, and what steps can we take to shape the housing development to ensure the landscape that we all love and want to protect is here. And the way to do it is to direct more development toward our centers. Um, and make investments to make these communities more vital. We need to shape where this housing is going to come. We shouldn't let it just happen willy nilly. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention too is, you know, the designation, final point, the designation programs, you know, I think you've heard me talk there. They've been on the books for 20 years. We've made tweaks to them. We've worked to refine them. Um, I think I know this committee is very interested in location-based jurisdiction. Um, but really kind of a challenge with the designations is they are not, they're not designed to do that exactly. They were designed as benefit districts, um, but that's, it's what we have. So it's what we've been using. I think they're a decent proxy for it, but we'd like to take a step back. We'd like an external review of the designation programs. Um, Senator Bray supported this in his Act 250 bill was an external view of the state designation programs um, to bring them up to contemporary standards. I think to get us on a path where we can look at designating the entire settlement area, not just little pieces of it, not just the center and the neighborhoods or this part of it. How do we look at the whole community holistically? And I think that sets us on a good, it creates a good foundation for ongoing conversations about location-based jurisdiction. Where do we wanna see investments happen? Where do we wanna discourage investments to happen? What kind of incentives are gonna get us the outcomes we want, of compact development in the centers? What kind of investments or what kind of tools and regulatory um, <clears throat> um, tools can we use to discourage um, investment in the countryside? Um, and that's all I got. Um, but I do, I hope you guys can support that because I think it is really important and I think it feeds into the work that you've been doing for several years. Great, thank you. Uh, I would love it if you could provide for us um, examples, uh, your 
Second to last slide uh, shows an inundation type of flood, um, but mostly what we know we're vulnerable to are erosion flooding hazards. And um, this kind of ask on the uh, infill development in flood prone areas has uh, is a concern to us. So if we could ground that conversation in specifics from the existing neighborhood development areas or like places that you I've got, know. I've got an example right now. I mean, you know, Taylor Street, um, the multimodal center, you know, that is in, you know, it is in the river corridor, in Montpelier's river corridor, yeah, but that is a managed corridor that's not going to move. The building is elevated. There's a, you know, bus station down below. Um, it's designed. So I, I'm, but I'm interested in like the universe of these. What's the, how much are we talking about in, in terms of increasing those investments? I, I get a little nervous when everyone's now all of a sudden deciding that those are not going to move when we've seen them, we've seen big things move before and they'll probably move again. So I just, I'm curious about how much are we talking about? How many Taylor streets exist out there that we're talking about? So in terms of the overall investment we may be looking at when we, if we, if we enable this change, just, it would be a more informed conversation. Yeah, I'm happy to work it. I, I don't know. I mean, we, I don't do development. I don't do buildings, um, but we can ask some of our partners. Well, I think it's a GIS exercise for me. So the river corridors that are in these designated areas and that would be in these expanded neighborhood development areas, I just am curious, how much land are we talking about? And there's been claims that they don't have anywhere else to grow, but there's usually an upland adjacent to a valley. And, and I, so I guess I'm... I think, it's, well... We can we can do some work on that. We don't have any GIS staff, but I think we can ask ANR to help. I don't know how quickly they don't work for us directly. I can try to get an answer to this. Um, I think the thing to understand though is, you know, right now ANR's policy on infill allows infill within these areas. It is in conflict. It conflicts with our neighborhood development areas. It says these are no go areas. Um, we want to bring these two programs into consistency with each other, but. I think the important nuance is if a community wants to do infill within the river corridor area, you know, to allow this, they have to adopt floodplain protections up and downstream um, to protect the entire community. The communities who have adopted river corridor protections are very limited. I want to think it's 10% of communities in the state. This is actually an incentive to in increase river corridor protection. I, I get it. I'm still just curious about yeah. what are we talking about in the universe? Yeah, I'm just saying the universe is pretty small because most communities are going to say, look, okay. you know, we don't want to adopt statewide river corridor standards in our community. So we're just going to exclude these areas. But for the small subset of communities who are willing to do it, um, I think it's a win. It's a net win. I think Representative Dolan was talking about the balancing act between the two. I got your question. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah. I'm not arguing one way or the other right now. I just need some information about what we're talking about in terms of Fair. area. And I'm in sales mode. Sorry. <laughs> I'm in fact finding mode. So, um, uh, and I lost my train of thought. But I do want to make sure that we get back to this question. Yeah, so, um, so, um, so thank you for your question, Representative McCullough. You know, I, I think this is not my area of expertise, so I'm just going to repeat a little bits of what I heard from other people. Um, there is a duplicative process that ANR testified to the fact that, you know, the municipality, you know, has the same requirements that the state does. The state has testified that their oversight is not doesn't have anything to do with the permit fee that they collect. So the oversight that, that gives you comfort, I don't think is substantive. Um, the oversight that ANR provides is usually at the treatment plant as far as that, you know, that's, that's as its own separate permit process. But we're talking about a very, very narrow set of permitting to make a connection to a water line, which what they look at to see is, is the connection designed appropriately to last you know 100 years or however long it needs because it's going to be buried in the ground is it the right size for the amount of people in the building and they also do the same for the waste pipe is it big enough to remove the waste from the building um, and the municipality needs to count the amount of gallons in and gallons out because that ties to their treatment permit from the state the state reviews this paper i don't think they review it but they collect a fee for doing the same amount of work you really need to talk to ANR about what their process and procedure is and their due diligence. But from my understanding is 
that there's not any meaningful oversight. And that's the frustrating thing for me is like, well, if there's not any meaningful oversight, why are we doing it? Um, you know, we want the environment to be protected. We want people to be safe in their homes. We want them to have clean water. Um, but if the process is creating a barrier to creating housing, and it is substantial, particularly for people wanting to build ADUs, you have to hire an engineer. Before you even start it, you have to hire an engineer, which can be very expensive. You have to get your local permit. Um, and I think you'll hear from Kathy Byer that the state permit can be take a long, long time to get. And the way Act 250 works is you, you can't proceed with your Act 250 permit review until all your state permits are in. And sometimes these permits have taken more than six months. You should talk to her about how long it's taken. And that's expensive to hold up a process, a project for a permit process that is not providing any meaningful environmental protection. That's my take on it. You should talk to a &R. They run this program. They are supportive of this change. And many of the other stakeholders who are involved in this conversation did not see any risk in removing this duplicative review. I guess I could see where the agency of natural resources, DEC, would be supportive of removing the program where they're totally understaffed, overstressed, and would like to uh, offload some work. So I'll just leave that as a comment as to uh, why I mean, they might want to be doing that. You should talk to him. I mean, this is, I'm, this is my understanding I, I of the world, it. but you should hear from them. So I got to go back to one thing. You said you don't have GIS staff. How do you get GIS support? Um, we um, so the agency. <laughs> it's a great question. I usually beg John Adams to help me from VCGI. Uh -huh. um, he doesn't work for us. He works with the Agency of Digital Services. So we do have um, um, limited support from Agency of Natural Resources. So we can occasionally ask for help, but we don't have any direct GIS person tasked to the agency. Did you used to before ADS? Um, it was more, well, before ADS, um, BCGI was part of ACCD. Yeah. So, and John Adams worked in our, in my division for several years. So it was very easy to ask him for like, hey, can you help us ground truth this? Um, and we can do that, but we just don't have, we don't have the same level of capacity service that we once did. So your question, I think is a good one, but I, can't, <laughs> I don't have anybody who works for me who can just do it. Um, so I will work on it. <laughs> wow, thank you. Uh, Representative Dolan. Uh, just to follow up on Representative McCullough's question, it's really about the permit pertaining to the discharge, you know, the treatment and discharge versus the hookup. Right. So nothing changes with respect to the treatment and discharge that's still within the ANR purview. So as to ensure compliance with the Clean Water Act and our water quality standards. Uh, and then the other question kind of um, more directly related to um, Representative McCullough is whether by removing the state, the, the duplication pertaining to the state and leaving the municipality, does that create, is there an incentive at the municipality's part to um, approve hookups because they're, you know, the more people hooking up to the system, you can spread those the costs of that um, of the maintenance of that infrastructure to a greater uh, rate base. So the um, so any issues pertaining to oversight um, is are they overlooked at the local level? Oh, no. So that's that's the kind of yeah. question. Are we are we creating a greater problem by removing state oversight? I think the question you need because to ask a and R, what is the nature of their oversight in this process? And if they tell you they go out right. to the engineers and look in the hole and to make sure it is the connection's good, but they rely on the same engineer that the municipality relies on to certify that the connection was done. Okay. And from what they've said in this committee is they collect their fee and they don't really look at them. They use that larger permit the, 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 at the plant to monitor compliance. Great, thank you. Representative Bungart, um, can you talk a little bit about how the tax credit works? Yeah, how much it is, and how it like you've got that you've got that house, one of those four houses, you know, but it's in the it's in your NDA. Thank you for one of giving your, me a question I can actually know a lot about. <laughs> what's the how big is the tax credit? How does it relate to the investment, and what are we what are we talking about? It's it's a I'm trying to do it really quickly. It is 
Um, so there's different tax credits. There's tax credits to improve the exterior of the building, so the facade tax credit. There's tax credits um, um, for code improvements to the building, so making them, you know, doing the fire protection or, or sprinkler system or anything you need to do to make, make the building safe, making the building ADA accessible, these things that are expensive that you need to do, um, but most people don't do them. And these are available only if you're in an NDA? Only if you're in a no, only if you're in a downtown or village center, right? Okay, okay. Um, and, and we want to, okay. And there's also tax credits for uh, the upper floor access. So wheelchairs, you know, elevators, lulas, you know, which are baby elevators. So how do you get people, how do you make the building fully accessible? Um, um, the really the, you know, when you do the application to, to qualify for the credit, really what your building needs actually determines what your actual tax credit yield will be. So if you don't need an elevator, you're gonna get a less tax, a smaller tax credit than if you do need an elevator. Um, um, there is an existing historic tax credit at the federal level um, for historic buildings that we key into. So if you qualify for a federal you know, rehab tax credit, you get an additional 10% from the state. So really depending on the facts and circumstances of the building and what the plans are, you kind of, you know, do this menu of options to figure out your tax credit yield. Um, you submit the application. They're always due in, in July. Um, the downtown board reviews them. Um, we always have significant, really more demand than we have available. So not everybody wins. It's usually we're about 2 million short of what actual demand is. Um, once you receive the tax credit, you do the project. Um, usually what people do is they take their tax credits because the members are not working on their building, you know, if you're only getting you know, five dollars a square foot, a bank's not going to loan you the money you need to improve the building. What the tax credit works out is like, here's a check from the state of Vermont. Full faith and credit of the state of Vermont behind you. The bank will loan on that. The project gets improved, and typically the bank purchases the credit after the fact. Somebody like me, you know, the tax credits can be fifty, a hundred, hundred fifty thousand dollars, depending on the nature of the project. I would die before I was able to use that tax credit. So most people sell them. They sell them, you can sell them to insurance companies, you can sell them to banks. They're usually lenders who purchase them. Um, banks being banks um, usually make a little money off the deal. If you give them $100 on a tax credit, they'll give you 97, seven, 97, seven, 97 cents back. Um, but they're you know, a tool that affordable housing communities use, that the affordable housing developers use, um, Ma and Pa Main Street you know, program, works um, and it is a unique program in so much as the ways and mean actually likes this type of revenue spending so um, they're very supportive of it um, and we'd like to see what it can do to support housing so does that help and that's high level okay so what we're talking about you can do it now in the downtowns but now we're talking about taking it out to the ndas and, and to these to the questions that were asked earlier about this the four houses and, and will the owner be interested it's really am i right is it that it will most likely be a developer seeing the opportunity and approaching the owner the owner's not going to get the tax right money. somebody's um, somebody's seeing the opportunity somebody's unwilling to do something with their property and they haven't done anything for 20 years it's probably going to be somebody else who does yeah. it. yes <laughs> i'll just okay give me an offer i can't refuse and if i know i've got a tax credit in my pocket to make that work i think you'll see some changes yeah okay Representative Sackowitz, a couple of questions about the tax credit. Mm -hmm. um, how, how is it decided which projects get the tax credits if you have more mm -hmm. demand than you have? It's a beauty contest. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> no, people have to fill out an application and kind of read the board has criteria, you know, um, that looks at you know, the community, need, you know, the value of the project and the return on the investment, you know, tax credit versus their dollars in. Um, and they have to make some tough decisions, you know, because they're, they're typically all great projects. Um, but they can't fund them all. And can, are these credits, are this credit application process only open to people who are owners of particular buildings? No, no. It's, it's, so you could have a project, so someone could have a project in mind and they say, if I get this tax credit, then I could go ahead and- Right, so a, a owners- building, Or you could well, have an agreement with, a, with an owner that says it's like contingent upon getting a tax credit. Owners or lessors are qualified, but you have to have the, if you're the leasee of the building, you have to have the permission of the owner to do the improvement. We often see this in Main Street buildings. You know, somebody owns the building, but a new business wants to go in. The owner's like, yeah, I'll sign the lease, but I'm not making the building improvements, you know, to just fit up your space or do whatever you need to make the building safe. Um, so in that instance, you know, the person leasing it will get the credit, make the building improvement. Okay, so it has to be an owner or, or someone who's leasing the building. And not for private homeowners. Yeah, this would not be for like, I can't get a tax credit to fix up my house. 
that I live in. Um, but if I wanted to do an accessory dwelling unit within my house, because my child's leaving the house, we've got, you know, we live in a 3000 square foot house. There's too much space for two people. And I want to divide the house and to create another unit. I would be able to, to create use the tax credit to create an accessory unit within that building. Yeah. So many of you talked about different types of the, there's different programs that for facade for mm -hmm. accessibility and such. Um, what, what would that one fall under? Well, it just depends, you know, it, like if it was just, if I was, um, let's say I just wanted to fix up the barn um, to make an accessory dwelling unit. So not subdividing within my existing home and the outside of the building needed a lot of work. And I wanted to make the building, you know, accessible because I wanted it to, um, you know, it was the right thing to do. It really depends on, you know, the, the nature of the development that's proposed. But but just because it's an accessory dwelling unit itself would not qualify it for a tax credit. No, the, the, the income producing, it has to be a rental property. Right. right, 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 right. But I'm saying in terms of being able to access the money, even if it's rent a rental property, mm -hmm. producing property, um, the fact that it's an accessory dwelling unit by itself would not be enough to trigger a tax credit. You'd have to you'd have to fall into one of these other criteria of facade or yeah, facade. yeah. I mean, one, you have to be income producing, and then two, with the needs of the building, have to be a good fit for what the program's offering. And then there's a cap, so right. not everybody who applies presumably gets it. Um, and I'm done. We're hoping, you know, with an, if we can get the increase in funding, that we can make the program a little bit more reliable and predictable. So. If I do X, Y is going to happen. Right now, it's a little bit of a risky proposition. I kind of get some other question, which is, um, you know, we're, we've, I've heard figures about the housing, the cost of the housing needs in, in the state being you know, like hundreds of millions of dollars. And we're talking about adding $2 million to this program. It, it, it's sort of seems like we're not, we're, we're not really talking about very much money mm -hmm. here compared to what our need is. It's what it seems. Right. Um, it, it also sounds like, um, it just feels like, it, like there's some sort of a disconnect here for me that um, that even though the program is oversubscribed, like you're getting more demand than you can fulfill sure. already, this increasing this increasing amount of money, especially if you open up to bigger areas, is probably not going to solve that problem. We're still going to have more demand, but it also sounds like the overall demand, which is out there for housing, is so much bigger than even what people are asking for help with. This is not the only housing investment we're making. Um, this is a little bit of a proof of concept that, you know, our ultimate goal is to, to get communities to modernize their bylaws, to create compact centers so people will develop them in a compact way, to get them open to change, welcoming change, to welcoming new communities, welcoming new members to their communities. Um, right now, we don't have the right benefits to get the small towns interested in this designation. Um, this is proposed as a five-year test to see if this, you know, shiny thing um, will get a select board's attention to go through the process to qualify. Again, bylaw, bylaws were the major barrier. We hope to, you know, we've got 41 towns working on bylaw modernization grants to overcome that barrier. The Senate supported an additional increase of another $650,000, so we have a next round of communities that will qualify. Um, you know, this is this is an incentive to get people's attention to modernize their zoning. Oh, I guess that's it's it. not going to solve the housing problem. But no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm just trying to wrap my mind around, you know, where, where it fits into the bigger right. the picture. Right. And um, we um, many communities, you know, the zoning is not supporting. You know, they have large minimum lot sizes, and they have water and wastewater infrastructure. It makes no sense. You know, this is, this is where homes can be naturally more affordable. Um, but where the zoning is such in the single family neighborhoods, you know, people don't want to change, you know, and how do we, how do we get these conversations yeah, going? Yeah, totally get that. Support that vision. Um, and we get it by getting a few communities, making a few changes and the sky doesn't fall and actually having a few more village was actually a good thing and people are more welcoming, but it's not going to, it's not going to change quickly. Okay. Um, just a, a small point the, the five, the, the five year sunset, that's just for this additional 2 million. It doesn't touch the. Um, so the principal, I think the way the bill structured, it increases the cap overall to five million base funding. The NDA benefit would sunset after five years. Okay. Okay. Oh, just one quick one. 
Um, does it matter short term, long term, short, short term or long term rental? As long as it doesn't matter. Um, um, right now, it's agnostic whether it's short or long term. Um, another piece of the bill, just FYI, is um, Senator Sorokin is a big fan of accessory dwelling units. There, there is a five million dollar carve out in the VHIP program specifically for accessory dwelling units. Those must be long-term rentals. They can't. Oh, so but the tax credit could be in either, but because I remember seeing that, so I thought, okay, okay, great, thank you, it's very helpful. All right, thanks for your time, and um, you know, if you have any more questions, you know how to get us, and we'll work on the mapping thing. But um, <laughs> I don't think I can get you something like you know, it may take a couple of days, uh, may even be next week. All right, thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Right, we'll take a 10 minute break.